we will go ahead and get started. Um, hello and welcome everybody to today's webinar, Facility Planning, uh, Using Facility Maintenance Data to Better Prepare for Capital Planning and Budgeting. Uh, we're excited to have Jack French, our Senior Analytics Manager, and Alex Welk, our Vice President of Sales, as our featured presenters today. Uh, we're going to explore how to use uh, facility data for capital planning. My name is Marcia Dagnan. I'll be the moderator today. Uh, before we begin, just a few housekeeping items to go over to make sure you get the most out of today's presentation. Um, please use the Q&A feature located in the menu at the bottom of the screen to submit questions anytime during the presentation. We do have time set aside at the end of the webinar to address um, any and all questions. If you're experiencing any technical issues during our presentation, please send me a message via chat directly. Um, I will help uh, troubleshoot as best I can. Uh, there are poll questions throughout the presentation. We will prompt you when it's time for a poll. The poll will automatically display on the screen for you um, to uh, select your answer and submit, and then we will uh, show results afterward. Uh, lastly, we are recording today's presentation. The on-demand version will be available on our website within the next few days. To get started, I would like to uh, introduce our presenters. Sorry. Uh, Alex Welk. Uh, Alex has spent the last 13 years in the facilities industry where he built and led large multi-site maintenance and managed uh, service programs for brands like 7-Eleven, ExxonMobil, McDonald's, Michaels, and more. Alex has been instrumental in streamlining processes, driving program value, expanding relationships, growing revenue, and saving uh, grip point customers millions of dollars. Jack French. Uh, Jack's passion for sustainability led him to grip point in June of 2016. He has been leveraging data to add value for GridPoint customers ever since. Jack took on a formal leadership role in 2020, developing the site acceptance and proactive monitoring teams. His experience spans multiple disciplines, including data validation, advanced analytics, measurement and verification, customer engagement, and control optimization. He also holds professional certifications in energy management and measurement and verification through the Association of Engineer Eng Energy Engineers. Sorry about that. Uh, so with that, we will go ahead and get started. Great. Thanks. Good afternoon. Um, so agenda today, we're going to start by understanding the role of maintenance data and how it can be used to inform capital investment decisions. Um, we'll also review common problems with gathering facility data, give some tips on optimizing budget allocation, talk about data gathering and analysis strategies. Finally, integration into existing processes for the sake of efficiency and this really isn't something that should necessarily add more to your workload. Um, although it might take a little bit of time investment up front to get everything stood up, once the processes are in place, this is really something that will streamline your organization's operating procedures. So key role of facility data. Um, let's start by defining facility data. So facility data can encompass a wide array of information um, usually characterizing the condition of performance uh, and history of various assets within the facility can often be gathered from work orders, asset performance records, equipment maintenance histories, and many more sources. So really anything that's available to you in terms of the operating health and condition of your sites. So understanding where you might have performance degradation issues um, or recurring uptime challenges or even cumulative reactive repair costs can help assess your, your current operating conditions. And this part is called performance evaluation. Um, so leveraging facility data via performance evaluation allows you to make informed decisions where, uh, about where to spend your facility budget effectively and avoid reactive service calls. So this is a data-driven strategy that promotes proactive operating procedures. And let's talk a, few, a little bit more about a couple types of facility data, different types of facility data. So um, we mentioned equipment maintenance history. So this can be information from work orders or any maintenance activities you're doing on site, um, repair histories, scheduled maintenance plans, things like that. So um, a lot of this can be already tracked in a CMMS or any other you know, service management service channel system that you have. So this should be data that generally is available for you. Um, energy and sustainability data. So this can include metrics like energy balance, utility data, carbon emissions, um, renewable energy usage, and even utility incentives. So all of this can be helpful pieces of facility data to help you 
make informed decisions about where to spend capital. And then finally, uh, asset performance records. So things like make, model, and tonnage of assets, location, building infrastructure, and even anecdotal data. Um, if you have you know, staff on site that are saying, yeah, this, um, this RTU isn't really providing us with enough cool air, that's good enough data as well for your facility to, to kind of start to make some informed decisions. Just to jump in here, I think if you think about uh, all that data um, and what do you what do you do next with it? How do you leverage that in a meaningful and cost intelligent way? I think you know if you look at the maturity of various organizations in different verticals, right? Um, there's a there's a wide array of how people do capital planning, right? Um, it's usually some mix of of art and science, um, depending upon how sophisticated and how much data you have, what how you're leveraging that. Um, sometimes it's more art than science, right? Sometimes it's a win. Uh, finger to the wind, unfortunately, but um, there is great power in, in harnessing uh, a lot of the types of data that, that Jack described um, and leveraging that in a meaningful way, right, to to go do your, your capital plan, both from a reactive capital as well as maybe some some preemptive project planning for, for the upcoming fiscal year, right? And so really, if you have it, um, and, and I've seen people that have mountains of it and don't make great use of it, right? So I think... Um, it really should play a pivotal role, right, in, in shaping capital investment decisions and how you spend your dollars intelligently, right? And so, you know, leveraging both performance data, uh, life cycle, life, life cycle data, um, you know, understanding the useful life, and then leveraging that to say, where do I want to prioritize my investment, right? So, um, again, we'll get into some of the, the sources of data and some of the challenges with it here in a minute. But ultimately, you know, we want to take this, this this body of knowledge and intelligence. We want to stratify it. We want to kind of align it to what our goals are, and then we really want to prioritize what are the things that are most important to us as a business, right? Be it store comfort, right? Maybe it's uh, throughput, right? If I'm a if I'm a restaurant operator, uh, maybe it's uh, you know in, in increased um, attention and and metrics around lighting. If I'm a, if I'm a key retailer. Um, but, but ultimately, we want to prioritize how we want to spend these dollars based on the data. And then we want to leverage. Uh, we all wish we had infinite budgets, but that's usually not the, the case when it comes to CapEx or OpEx for that matter, right? So um, I, I think understanding where we want to spend it and then knowing if I've got five or, or $10 million to spend in a given year, here's how I'm going to do that, right? Whether that's equipment upgrades, uh, replacements, various system enhancements, um, maybe addressing some structural issues that have reared their head, you know, 15, 20 years later. But ultimately, um, you know, the asset condition, the performance trends, all the types of data we're going to kind of showcase here in a little bit are all critical drivers, right, that should inform a, a capital investment strategy. Next slide, please. So obviously not, not easy, right? We live in the world of, of big data. Um, sometimes, you, you know, it's like looking for a needle in a, in a haystack and how do we make sense of it? So lots of challenges, right? Um, kind of going through this visual here today, uh, you know, data is often incomplete, right? Or it doesn't tell the whole story. Sometimes we have very objective data, right? Um, that are things like, you know, costs and volume, um, you know, maybe mix of, of trade categories, et cetera. There's others that are a little bit more gray, right? Maybe it's um, the condition of a rooftop unit, right? Um, is it good? Is it fair? Is it poor? Is it, you know, on a scale of one to nine, what does a seven look like? Does it look different from technician to technician or, or part, different parts of the country? So, um, you know, there's some calibration and some, some art and science that goes into what do we do with incomplete data? Um, by trying to, to balance the budget of, of what's most important, again, back to the business objectives. Um, is, is it my rooftop units, right? In terms of comfort, is it lighting? Is it rev gen equipment and back of house if I'm a restaurant operator? Um, and then obviously there's lots of inconsistency in data, right? Um, and those in, inconsistencies can come from, from people and how it's collected. It can come from uh, variation in processes and sometimes even um, in, in technology where there are uh, disparate use or not full uh, adoption of, of how a technology may be used for data acquisition purposes. And then we have lots of systems, right? Um, probably you have some kind of uh, way of tracking your maintenance today, right? Both in a reactive and capital fashion. Um, those could be in um, com computerized maintenance management systems or CMMSs. They could be uh, in an EMS system that we're gonna spend a lot of time leaning into today. It could be in an XLS system, right? We, we store a lot of data in, in spreadsheets or smart sheets. Um, you know, some folks that are starting out and scaling their, their multi-site operation might be dispatching, um, not unheard of, on, on, on sticky notes and trying to keep, keep track of things pretty archaically. So 
there's lots of disparate sources, um, right, and, and formats of this data. How do we bring it all together in a meaningful way? Um, sometimes it's it's flat out missing and inaccurate. Um, and then again, we've got to make sense of it all. So, you know, these are just just a handful of the challenges. There's probably another 10, but, um, you know, it, it is worth going through and mitigating a lot of these challenges and controlling for them because the, the, the power in harnessing this and how it impacts the quality of your decisions when it comes to your equipment and your, your capital investment is, is uh, paramount. Okay, and we have come to our very first poll. Question on our poll today is, are you currently using maintenance data to inform your capital planning and budget allocation? Yes, no, or planning for planning to in the near future? We'll go ahead and leave that up for just a minute and let everybody uh, answer. All right, go ahead and end that poll and show results. So it looks like every 100% uh, are planning to in the near future. Good thing awesome. to hear. Good, yeah, <laughs> good, good, good sign. <laughs> All right, <clears throat> go on to our next slide. All right, yeah, let's talk about some benefits. So, um, Cost savings, obviously very important to everyone. So in what ways can we achieve some cost savings by using facility data to make informed decisions about maintenance? Um, minimizing downtime, extending equipment lifespan, optimizing repair and retrofit planning, just a couple ways that um, you can realize some cost savings by leveraging this methodology and uh, improved asset management. So this is gonna keep you apprised of your equipment's operating conditions you can better understand where there are opportunities for improvement. Um, and then, you know, all of these lead into enhanced decision making. Um, and that's kind of the point of this, right? So using a data-driven strategy to identify where to spend budget and ensure you're allocating funds appropriately while avoiding unintentional errors or oversights. So three types of maintenance, um, and this will probably be review. But uh, let's start with reactive. So this is probably the most common out there in the industry, um, often referred to as run to fail. It's, you know, like I said, the most common practice today. So this strategy tends to leave you on the back foot where equipment's already failed um, or experienced some form of failure, then you have to respond to it in real time and after the issue has already occurred. So this is obviously a you know, fire drill type of um, way to react to maintenance related issues and um, doesn't use, you know, involving data to inform your strategies on how to perform maintenance. So that moves us into preventative maintenance, which is certainly a recommended strategy here. Um, so this is kind of regularly scheduled service for your equipment. Um, and it's a really great way to gather history and performance data. Uh, it helps you aid in that informed decision-making. So this could be seasonal work such as cleaning coils, replacing filters, um, checking to make sure dampers are operational because there are two types of dampers, failed and about to fail. Um, and, you know, this strategy really helps prevent some of the reactive efforts and work that we just talked about with the, um, the first strategy. So it also aids you with the data that we talked about. So work order history, um, you know, recurring visits for preventative maintenance keep you up to date on how well your equipment is performing and you know, what type of attention is needed for each piece of equipment or each asset within the building. So it gives you an idea if you have you know, recurring service calls for an issue in the reactive form, then you're performing preventative maintenance and every time you're performing preventative maintenance, well, maybe that is a problem unit and should be considered for retrofit. So that's just one of the ways that the data can help you. Um, now predictive, so this strategy requires a little bit more sophisticated monitoring tools um, and that can come in, in many forms, but um, the output of these tools is usually leveraged by a data analyst or an engineering professional. It doesn't have to be, but most commonly, you know, with BMS or EMS systems, that's the route most folks chose, choose to go. Um, and this can be diagnostic testing or equipment performance modeling, 
um, health reports or energy consumption anomalies. Um, a lot of these artifacts can be useful to help aid in this predictive maintenance strategy. Um, and it helps to inform you and align your budget with the proper preventative maintenance investments. So predictive sort of can sometimes lead into preventative. Um, if you have a, a model that's gonna predict, okay, equipment may fail in two to four weeks. Okay, well, time to schedule some preventative maintenance so that we can get ahead of that. So we're not left with the first strategy, which we recommended or well, didn't recommend, but first strategy that we discussed, which is the reactive strategy. So we certainly wanna avoid that, move into preventative, ideally predictive to inform preventative. Okay, so let's look at some of the ways that we do this today. Um, so identifying asset performance trends, the pie chart on the top left kind of gives an idea of an HVAC's health score. So in this particular slide, we're, we're speaking specifically about HVAC units. So for this month of data that we evaluated, 93% uh, of units had no issue whatsoever. So that's, that's pretty excellent. That means only 7% of the units for this enterprise needed some attention or had some type of health issue during this time. Um, and we can kind of categorize these in different ways. We not only quantify the performance of the unit, but we also qualify. It. So we can um, look at the units that are cooling effectively, but not reaching set point. So meaning that the supply air temperature is cool, but the zone is still trending above the configured cool set point. And then there's unit not cooling, which would be a higher severity issue, meaning that the supply temperature is not sufficient to condition the space and you know the zone is above the cooling set point. So one of the most important metrics that we use in quantifying units performance is the zone versus set point delta. So how far away is the zone temperature from the configured set point? And you know, what does that mean in terms of the HVAC's health? Um, let's qualify it. Let's figure out a plan to um, service it you know, before it becomes a, a more significant comfort concern or equipment related reactive failure. Um, and the, the bar chart here shows kind of how far away the units are from set point for the top five issues for this particular data set. And then the tabular data below shows that detail. So where are your current occupied set points? Um, this can give you an informed decision on, hey, do I just need to make a set point change here? Am I being a little bit too aggressive with my set point? Um, all of these are between 74 and 75. So these are very conservative in terms of the energy consuming direction. But say you have a unit that's set to 68 degrees and you're constantly trending at 72, well, why not set that set point to 72? Because the unit can, can meet that set point consistently, but it can't meet 68. So that, you know, again, is going to reduce wear and tear on your unit, extend unit lifetime. Um, so looking at all this data together and understanding the relationships between it can really aid in making informed decisions about where to spend capital. Okay, and we have come to our poll uh, number two question. What is the biggest challenge your organization faces in collecting and managing maintenance data for facility management? Data accuracy and completeness, data security and privacy concerns, integration of data from various sources, or limited resources for data collection? Thank you. I'll go ahead and share that second poll, right? And give everybody just a minute to go ahead and answer. All right, go ahead and share the results. So we had a pretty even uh, across the board minus uh, data and security and privacy concerns. Yeah, we talked about some of those challenges in the first one. So it's so definitely, uh, definitely a nod to, to that. Um, talk a little bit about the integration, right? Another one of the, the challenges. Um, so it, it looks like uh, people are experiencing, you know, pr pretty consistent uh, with, with how we kind of outlined up, up front. So, um, you know, all, all viable um, obstacles to kind of overcome on this, on this journey. So Absolutely. Good distribution. All right. Have... Good, good poll question. <laughs> <laughs> we will get back to you. I think when you think about, you know, prioritizing, um, leveraging this data, I think there's some, you know, a handful of critical factors to, to think about in that prioritization process, right? How critical are these assets to the operation, right? To, to the core functions of the business, or maybe to some of the, the corporate goals that, 
um, that you're trying to achieve, right? Um, if assets fail, what's the impact of that, right? In terms of, um, you know, health and, and so safety standards or OSHA violations. And, you know, I think across, you know, transcending all verticals and, and, and concepts, I think in multi-site um, real estate, I think, you know, for me, most of my, you know, current and, and past customers have, have always prioritized, you know, safety, people and, and profit, right? And usually in that order. So if you think about, um, you know, how things are going to, to impact the, you know, the environment, um, not just from a comfort level, but a complete safety uh, level, the, the people in their comfort. And then again, you know, how is this going to impact, um, you know, the, the financial res results of, of the business on a day in, day out basis? Um, you've know, worked with with a lot of folks that think, hey, we, we need to track everything. We need to put a QR code and slap an asset tag and collect make model and serial on everything. That's not it's really not always the case. Right. I mean, there, there are cost considerations here that may be before you even start the acquisition process. And everyone said they're, they're you know, thinking about and getting on this journey of, of leveraging um, this type of data for, for capital planning. Um, you don't need to do everything right. Um, you know, classic example that I found with my, my QSR operators. Right, is that um, you know I had some some brands and folks that hey we really need to ask the tag um, you know uh, coffee pots and and um, kind of you know looser equipment that we want to make sure we keep track of and and that's all fine or well right but in terms of you know harnessing and aggregating data at that level microwaves are probably another good example um, in a commercial application they may cost two or three hundred bucks but by the time um, you know, you go replace one of those, by the time you repair one of those things and aggregate the spend associated with it, you could just buy a new one, right? So you don't, it's not anything and everything. You got to really think about what assets are most critical to, to your goals. Um, I think that the history, right, in terms of like, let's look at um, a cross section of the biggest energy hawks, right? What, which are the units that I've spent the most money on both preventatively and reactively? Where, where do I have to keep buying compressors that go out like every few years and might be more um, symptomatic of a, of a larger problem, right? Um, you know, what is what is 25 years old and, and likely, you know, five plus years past its useful life. So, you know, in this day and age, I think just about every CMMS system, um, you know, off the shelf or customized has a way to aggregate spend and volume, right? And the detail associated at an asset level. So I think, you know, acquiring that at, at at that level of the asset and then being able to really stratify and understand um, in a perfect world, I'd love to look at where have I spent the most? And then I'd like to lay that over with where am I consuming the most? And, and kind of that, that overlay of the think of a Venn diagram is, is probably a pretty smart decision of where you want to focus your, um, your investment dollars. Right. Um, I think, you know, remaining useful life can be uh, an important metric. I think there's a mixed bag in terms of, you know, how good uh, are the records of your finance group in terms of install date and how that's the, how that capital uh, equipment is depreciated. Um, you know, a side note that I always think about, you know, when it comes to useful life is uh, it's not always what the accountants or the manufacturers tell you it is. A lot of times the store environment really matters, right? Um, you know, again, it, spend a lot of time in restaurants. So, I think about, you know, revenue producing assets like like ice machines, let's say, right, in, in the back of house of a, you know, a restaurant of any, any variety. Um, you know, they may tell you something in the last 15 years, but if it's in a tight, confined space and maybe it's um, up against a piece of hot side equipment that's venting right against it, a universal holding cabinet, a grill, a fryer, um, how long that lasts and holds up and un under those conditions is a lot, lot different, right? So it might look a lot different in a, in a QSR's kitchen than it does, um, you know, in maybe a different environment. So I think those are important considerations to make. And then finally, what is the impact on the user experience, right? I think this is where we really need to think about bringing in um, kind of output metrics, if you will, right? So, um, you know, things that, that are maybe that we can survey for in terms of employee satisfaction, right? Or, uh, customer retention, um, customer satisfaction. Um, maybe your organization um, invests in kind of the whole net promoter. So is it an NPS score? Is it foot traffic we're trying to, to, to drive? Um, so there's some things we can get around both objectively and subjectively to say, um, you know, this is important and we need to look at how this, this, uh, this impacts that metric. So again, kind of four big pillars there to think about as you're prioritizing um, your, your, your uh, usage of data. And then I think, you know, important to give a nod here that, um, you know, again, this is an art and a science. I'll, I'll go back to that again. I think um, you have to make some considerations about 
um, what do you need in the short term? What do you need in the long term? Right. So um, there are some things that are going to require immediate attention. Um, right. There are some things that we do at, at Gridpoint in terms of identifying and isolating the real problems that need to be dealt with today. Right. Maybe some things that are going to be problematic if you don't deal with them in the next six months to a year. And then the balance of the universe is everything is operating well. Right. So um, we've got to give a nod and, and, and think about it's not just the big projects we want to go tackle, but we have to plan throughout the year that, you know, based on all the sets of data and the criteria, there are some things that are going to fail. And guess what? We're going to have to replace it reactively. We're going to have to go rent a crane and drop a new rooftop, a 20 ton unit on a, on, on a building at some point, because um, we know the kind of age demographic for our fleet. Um, but again, we can leverage the book and, and operational value. Um, and I think, you know, again, this, this is where we really have to bring in what are the strategic goals of the organization? Um, and, you know, I think it's important what, what I see people usually do with this plan, even if it's founded on great data, is it's a set it and forget it. And I think, you know, there's, there's great importance to kind of look at how is this capital investment um, driving the desired results, right? How are we lowering, lowering things like total cost of ownership, right? Whether that's quarter over quarter or year over year. What about average ticket costs, right? In a reactive environment, if we've replaced and done a good job with our capital planning, um, theoretically over time, I mean, that may not be in year one, but theoretically over time, you know, we should see metrics like that um, move, move the needle in the right direction, which is down, right? We wanna see lower costs. We wanna see, um, you know, greater mean time between failure, right? We wanna see uh, tickets going down. We wanna see the overall cost of maintaining the fleet um, reduce. And I think that's important to look at, you know, more than, you know, once a, once a fiscal year. Back to our next poll question. Yes. <laughs> next poll question, poll number three, which type of maintenance data analytic tools or software does your organization use, if any? Uh, you can check all that apply. Go ahead and add this. Go ahead and put it up on the screen. All right, so data analytics software, machine learning algorithms, uh, visualization tools, energy management system, computerized uh, CMMS, or an asset management system. Give everyone just a minute to go ahead and answer that. Okay, it looks like just about everyone is answered. So we'll go ahead and end and share the results. So an asset management system uh, is definitely the top, uh, followed by data analytics software. Awesome. Yeah, and I think, you know, these these things, these tools are becoming more and more integrated, right? I think, um, you know, in the world of APIs and an open architecture, right, where, where information can be passed back and forth. I think there's a, there's a ton of power in that. So, um, you know, hopefully these things are being used not just in isolation, but but again, the, the power to bring this types of information, these types of data, um, you know, whether it's in a, you know, a Power BI or, or some other kind of, um, you know, business intelligence or, or, or visual tool um, is, is uh, very compelling and, and usually meaningful. All right, and with that, we will go ahead and uh, move on to our next slide. Great, okay. So let's talk about long-term planning. Um, <clears throat> couple, you know, couple notes here. Um, first and foremost, stay the course. So continuously collect facility data and ensure that it's accessible to your organization throughout the year. That way, whenever you may need direction, prioritizing capital investment for maintenance, you can refer to an accurate and relevant data set. So, um, you know, if something's worth doing, it's worth doing right. And it's worth doing consistently, right? Not just when you think you need it. So stay the course is kind of first and foremost in terms of long-term planning. Um, we found that most facilities will, um, are well, we found that most facilities are nearly three times more likely to experience um, equipment failures during the beginning of the cooling or, or heating season. Um, so performing regular preventative maintenance before you start the next season can help mitigate equipment failures throughout the year. Um, and then, you know, of course, in the lens of promoting efficiency and sustainability, um, these are likely meaningful goals for your organization. So to ensure success, your equipment should be reliable, fully operational, and configured correctly. 
um, efficiency, efficiency and sustainability are ongoing goals. So leverage facility maintenance data with the long-term in mind. So benefits of an energy management system, um, asset control and monitoring. So having centralized control and ongoing audits of schedules and set points can help ensure that your enterprise is compliant with its overarching efficiency goals. Um, using real-time diagnostics is a really helpful tool. The ability to review real-time status of your units and perform testing that you, know, you can observe gives you an understanding of current conditions of your assets and how they're responding. Um, historical comparison is also a big one. So this can be really helpful to track performance degradation over time, uh, especially for aging units or you know, where there are efficiency or efficacy gains that you know, for, re for recently serviced equipment. Um, data trends and weather normalization. So this is a huge one for M&V. Um, you know, most facilities are very influenced by the weather outside. So understanding how the weather influences your potential HVAC loads is extremely important. So using data trends and using weather normalization are really, really helpful tools, especially when measuring and verifying the performance of, say, an HVAC retrofit. So then, of course, um, you know, Alex mentioned earlier, we, we live in the big data world, which is very true. So a lot of the benefit of having an energy management system is organizing and storing data easily. Um, you know, we have a visual here that shows a you know, controller, meter, thermostat, duct sensors, um, all of the data that's being collected at this site are you know, then sent to the controller, which is then sent out to a server. So with all that data, we can perform everything that we just talked about, control and monitoring, real-time diagnostics and historical comparison, everything that we just talked about, um, and the data is organized and stored in one central location that gives you the ability and the flexibility to understand, you know, where you have potential performance degradation issues, um, where is going to be the most suitable to look at for maintenance. Um, continuing on with some benefits of energy management systems. So uh, they can extend the life of your assets, especially by using setback during unoccupied periods and analyzing performance metrics. Uh, minimizing energy waste, of course, by maintaining corporate set point policy, like we mentioned before. And um, a lot of these really overlap. So um, one kind of plays into another and another. Um, all of these bullet points are very much you know, intermingled and, and related. So on minimizing energy waste, nightly setback when, when the building is unoccupied. Um, of course, no reason to condition a space or keep lights on when the space isn't occupied. Um, drive energy savings, you know, again, uh, measure asset efficacy and optimize schedules, um, minimizing operational inefficiencies. So identifying performance degradation and servicing units when appropriate before seasonal changes. That helps you to maximize your uptime and thereby minimizes operational inefficiencies. Okay, so whole building approach. Um, what is comprised in an energy management system? Well. Um, really, there's a lot that we can go into. So we'll go into some of the core components, um, but energy management systems are generally very modular, starting with the controller. And then from the controller, you can have all kinds of peripherals, right? So the most common, at least for us, is smart thermostat and HVAC control. So this allows you to do exactly what we talked about earlier and give you insight into um, you know, what your set points are, what your schedules look like. Are you maintaining your corporate set point compliance policies? Um, are you, you know, well configured to meet your energy efficiency or energy savings goals. Um, and then, you know, with thermostats and HVAC control, there's advanced algorithms that intelligently control your HVAC units, things like intelligent setback, things like advanced recovery, um, load curtailment, all of these are, you know, opportunities for you to increase your efficiency a little bit more given, you know, occupied versus unoccupied period changes and almost, you know, dynamic uh, peak demand control. So another piece of that is HVAC unit performance tracking. So as I mentioned, the energy management system collects all the data that's being measured on site. And with a smart thermostat and HVAC control, you have the thermostat itself. You may have a zone sensor that's separate. If the thermostat's back in the manager's office, for example, and you have a, a unit that services a dining room that's out you know, in the front of the store, um, <clears throat> you know, could have a zone sensor and you'll have a duct sensor to measure the temperature of air coming out of the supply. So, all of these pieces of data together 
are important in understanding how well your unit is responding. You know, particularly the zone temperature versus the set point, which we mentioned a few slides ago. And then of course, to qualify the performance of the unit, um, what temperature air is coming out? You know, if we're calling for heat, we should be seeing, you know, 90 to 120 degrees in the supply. If we're calling for cool, well, ideally we should be seeing um, around 45 to 60 degrees in the supply. And if we're not seeing, you know, the numbers that we're expecting based on what the thermostat is asking the unit to do, it can help us not only quantify, but qualify the performance of the unit. Um, another, you know, additional piece of an energy management system that can be really, really helpful is indoor air quality monitoring, which is where we come into CO2 concentration and humidity monitoring. Um, you know, these could inform decisions. If you have ongoing CO2 and humidity issues, you may want to consider adding a makeup air unit to your system. Or, you know, you may want to opt into some of the algorithms that are offered or, you know, add hot gas, add a unit with hot gas reheat to mitigate humidity. Um, by tracking all of these, these metrics, it can allow you to make informed decisions on, you know, where you should spend your, your capital and um, where you have potential issues and what you can do to solve those issues. You know, can you solve them with the existing infrastructure or do you need to consider a retrofit? And finally, lighting control. So lighting control is um, really straightforward, you know, instead of having to make sure all the switches are turned off when you leave the building, set the lighting on a schedule. It's just a relay. So lights can be turned on and off dynamically. We can use photo sensors based on, you know, ambient light level. If, if it becomes overcast, turning on the parking lot lights outside of schedule. Um, this really is the set it and forget it strategy. And lighting is almost a no brainer. Um, even with signage, you know, signage can be turned on and open and off at closed. So, you know, patrons know that the, uh, the business is, is open or closed. Um, so really, really simple and effective strategy in energy management. Um, and then finally, there's refrigeration monitoring. So looking at um, how long doors are open um, or looking at internal temperatures and then alerting based on temperature thresholds that could be concerning. And, and this is really more health and food safety than it is uh, an energy saving opportunity, but it's, it's part of an energy management system. It can be bundled in um, because of the flexibility of the system and how modular it can be. So um, if, you know, maintaining cooler freezer temperature compliance is something that's really important to you, then of course, this is a uh, part of the solution that could be considered. Thanks. All right, so using IP MVP for accurate data comparison. Um, for those not familiar, IP MVP is a word salad. It stands for International <laughs> Performance Measurement and Verification Protocol. Um, say that three times fast and try not to get tongue tied. <laughs> um, there are six sort of key concepts within IP MVP. So accurate, complete, conservative, consistent, relevant, and transparent. Um, I'm not going to talk about each of these in particular. I, I want to be aware of time. So really, we've talked about collecting, you know, gathering facility data. We've talked about some challenges associated with that. Um, but, you know, like I mentioned in planning for the long term, stay the course. So keep consistently gathering data. Um, ensure that anything you're relying on as far as a sensor or a meter is properly calibrated and serviced regularly. That promotes accuracy. Um, ensure completeness. So uh, making sure that equipment uptime is maximized wherever possible so that you're still collecting the data that you need. Um, any MNV plan should be conservative and relevant, of course. You know, historical data is really, really helpful. But what you really want to know to get an idea of where to spend your capital for facility maintenance is what's going on right now and what could potentially happen in the not so distant future. So historical data can be used to sort of benchmark unit performance and that can help inform relevant decisions based on, okay, what's happening today versus what happened last year? Am I seeing performance degradation? Well, of course, um, that's relevancy. And then finally, transparency. So this is probably one of the most important pieces of any m and plan and making sure that you have accurate data comparison. Um, any m and plan should be documented and there are a lot of reasons it should be documented. There might be an energy performance contract that relies on funding for an energy saving measure or energy saving opportunity or efficiency improvement. And um, there might be some utility incentive associated with it. That's gonna require the MV plan to be documented and have you know, plenty of data available to provide the utility and say, hey, yes, I did this project. This is how I measured it. This was the performance. And you know, now show me the money, right? So transparency is extremely important with MNV. I think one thing that would be um, interesting and useful is to kind of talk a little bit about um, 
commercial models, right, in the energy management space. Um, you know, GridPoint certainly is not a one size fits all, but you know, there is one commercial model we go to market with that I think is is vastly popular. And the reason it is is it's essentially a, a subscription based model where you pay a fixed fee per store per month through the through the life of an agreement, right? So. Um, if you're familiar with the term SaaS or software as a service, um, we get a little cute with ours. We call it EMAS, which is energy management as a service. Um, and effectively, um, why it's so attractive and popular, right, is that um, it enables folks to leverage CapEx dollars in a nominal uh, way relatively, right, than a big upfront capital investment, right? So, um, you know, no major startup costs in terms of a, you know, paying for installation and equipment um, upfront. You know, you have the ability to pay that and we amortize it over, let's say, if we were to do a five-year deal, um, we would essentially have a fee associated for the hardware, the software, and the service associated with that through the life. Um, you know, of that agreement. So um, with that, obviously, you get the energy benefits, there's operational benefits, and certainly resiliency benefits that I'll talk about here in a minute. To the right side of the slide here, um, draw your attention to a couple things. So on the left side, you can see kind of this, this monthly fee subscription, that's the full, full bar. Oftentimes in different utilities and, and uh, geographies, there are uh, utility-based programs or integrator-based programs where you can actually fund some of that, um, in some cases, all of that, um, in, in terms of offsetting the cost, right? So uh, rebates, incentives uh, in a variety of different forms and different governing governing rules and organizations, um, but but that's kind of the, the differentiator there as you see kind of the two-shaded uh, bar graph there, right? So some of that you can you can actually recoup um, right out of the gate based on, um, based on, on rebate programs. If you look over to the right, that, that first shading of, of blue, right, is typically what we see in terms of reduction savings. So as you'll notice, right, the height of that is quite a bit taller than, than uh, wherever your, your price point would be uh, in terms of the investment for the monthly fee, right? So we're typically not going to pencil a deal that doesn't at least meet the table stakes of, of breaking even. And, and um, you know, nine times out of 10, it's, it's, it's often much more of that, right? So um, that could be anywhere from a, you know, maybe a 5% on, on the low end all the way to we do save um, utility bill, um, you know, cost avoidance of up to, you know, the low 20s, 21, 22% with some of the customers that are getting the best bang for their buck in terms of that investment, which is incredible. So, um, so, so, you know, at the surface level, the quantifiable piece right out of the gate um, typically pencils for us and, and, you know, you invest a couple hundred bucks a month and you're able to save you know, more than that, 300, 400 bucks, um, we're doing our job, right? But it doesn't stop there. If you look up um, kind of the color code of arts, there's a whole lot, I, I think of it as the tip of the iceberg analogy, right? So the savings are great. Everybody wants to save money. But what this enables, what our solution enables at GridPoint, right, in terms of the line of sight, the visibility, um, we, we can do things like demand response, right? So working with various utilities to uh, curb, you know, peak usage. And there's a couple components to that, right? Um, one, if there are certain uh, demand response events where we can help uh, do our part for the grid in a given geography, um, you know, we're going to do two things. We're going to probably avoid a pretty considerable uh, premium at that time. Let's think about California and brownouts and all that. And, and maybe from four o'clock to eight o'clock, we're able to, to avoid those, those really um, high peaks in, in terms of charges. But there's also some revenue benefit where the utilities will actually give you money back as part of a, a governed demand response say, uh, program. So we have a lot of folks that will start, you know, and focus on the on the energy curtailment and savings associated within the utilities, but they will build on from that to say, hey, I wanna do my part uh, for my sustainability go goals and I'm, I'm gonna actually save some money, some uh, incremental money in the process. Um, operational benefits, right? If, if we can leverage our, our system and we do it every single day to help diagnose a problem and, and triage something and solve it remotely or help our customers or our store managers solve it, we will. I think for my facility managers, some of the folks, we all, folks on the phone, we all know that, you know, an HVAC tech is happy to run a truck and, and charge you for a trip charge and now our labor to come out and, and do some kind of reset, right? And everything's back to normal, right? That's probably gonna cost you these days 250, 300 bucks. So, you know, if we can prevent even a truck roll a year um, depending upon the size of the portfolio, that's very significant. Um, look, we talked about capital investment, like where should we focus our dollars? How do we protect that capital investment by extending the life of, of, of assets? How do we lower runtime, right? How do we make sure that we're balancing um, the equation between comfort and, and a cash outlay for, for um, utilities, 
right? So um, th there's a lot to be said over time that if, if we can wait uh, another year or two, right, to put something into our capital plan, we've done a really uh, significant job in, in, in prolonging that. And that's, um, you know, that can be very meaningful, meaningful financially. Um, Look, there's a lot of time and motion to do this without a centralized control system of, of, you know, just pure policy. If we wanted to say, hey, tomorrow I want to take my 500 store portfolio and I want to I want to change these things. And there isn't a centralized control strategy and, and the equipment and, and um, software and service to do that. There's time and motion and, and probably a lot of uniformity issues in terms of governing that policy. Right. So um, for us, that's a click or two. Right. If we wanted to make a change like that. Um, and then certainly there are catastrophic things that happen, right, where um, if we can get out ahead of it, as Jack talked with some of the prescriptive or predictive maintenance, um, right, we can tell that an HVAC is probably going to fail, um, you know, at the next heat wave, we can identify some of those HVAC health issues and avoid, you know, a restaurant shutting down because it's too hot, right, or there's, there's um, complaints and maybe OSHA or, a, you know, an inspector gets involved with a, with a notice of violation and shuts the store down for two years. And that does happen. Um, you know, we, we have a lot of uh, strong case studies where we've been able to, to help mitigate and prevent those things from happening. And those are really big ticket items. So uh, again, EMAS is um, not the only way to go, but um, regardless of the commercial model, tons and tons of both financial and peripheral um, operational benefits here. So I think we threw a lot at you, um, a lot to kind of consume in a, in a short 45 minutes. I think, you know, four big takeaways for me are, are kind of up here on the on the screen. I think, again, um, you know, data driven decisions are critical to make smart, cost intelligent investments from a capital standpoint. Again, you're, you're never going to take the, the, the art and make it pure science, but I would urge everyone to leverage the data you have, build upon the data you have and, and try to get a little bit better year over year fiscally, um, you know, my strong recommendation is, you know, if, if you can rely two thirds to 80, maybe as much as 90% on the science, the art becomes a lot easier to kind of select and prioritize based on your budget constraints, right? So leverage that data um, to really whittle down the list and understand where you want to focus your, your, your dollars and your investment. Um, again, it's about balance. We've got to make sure we take care of the things today that are problems and we need to get out and address those before they become larger problems, both from an OPEX and CAPEX standpoint. I think, um, you know, the relationship between, you know, finance and the facilities uh, team and any organization, the relationships have to be there. The lines of communication have to be there um, as well as the plan to understand what are we going to do with the data? And maybe most importantly, if this is the capital decision, we're going to, make what does good look like right how are we going to measure that I, I mentioned earlier things like total cost of ownership how do we get better how do we make sure we made the right decisions and if we didn't right how for the next capital planning cycle do we think about doing things a little bit different so you know that integration between finance and, and the facilities team is is really pivotal and then lastly um you know leveraging a strategy of, of an ems system i i think certainly you, you know we may be biased but i think that the power of harnessing our type of solution um, is incredibly valuable. You can drive cost savings, right? You can drive, uh, as Jack and I both mentioned, uh, operational efficiencies, lines of sight, enhance your sustainability program, right? Everyone is looking to do that if they're part of the grid as well as for, for, for the world. Um, I think better alignment with strategic uh, business objectives is, is a byproduct of this as well. Um, but but get started with a system, look into to how these things can benefit you in terms of opening up lots and lots of po um, um, possibilities. Again, I think leveraging maintenance data can, can truly transform um, both your facility management, your budget allocation process, ultimately fueling and, and driving organizational success in all of your capital planning um, efforts. All right, so to round it off, uh, real life results. So we did have a commercial retailer approach us a few years ago. Um, looking to leverage the data that the EMS has been collecting to help prioritize HVAC units for retrofit. So um, this customer had a lot of data already at their disposal, and they wanted to include all of the EMS data. They've been installed with us since 2012. So we had a ton of historical data that we could draw on as well. Um, so we decided to help them with this request, although it's not something that is part of our standard out-of-the-box offerings. With energy advisory services, this would fall under kind of an ad hoc request. So what we did is we put some data together for them. So we looked at HVAC equipment, 
and we ranked them using a couple of metrics that we came up with um, in conjunction with the customer and setting requirements for what this analysis was going to look like, coupled with their you know qualified data um, such as HVAC make model tonnage, age, which is listed here. Um, we came up with operating cost per ton, overall runtime across a year, percentage uptime across a year, and then days with HVAC exception across a year. So this gave the customer a really full picture of what their overall enterprise level HVAC health looked like to the asset level. And um, the outcome was that they were able to allocate funds accordingly towards retrofits. And um, they felt that their, their allocation was effective based on all the data that they had collected and the data that we had put together for them. So this is an example of you know, real world, real life results um, of how leveraging this type of data can help you know, make the right informed decisions on where your capital investments should be. Um, so thanks so much for all your time today. Hey, thank you both so much. Um, very informative webinar. Uh, I, we do have just a few questions. Uh, the first question is, how often should facility managers be gathering facility data? I would say whenever uh, <laughs> whenever possible, especially whenever anything is serviced, right? So whenever you have a technician on site, you know, working on replacing a belt on a unit or replacing a, a blower motor or even, you know, cleaning coils and filters like we mentioned during the preventative maintenance discussion, um, certainly, at the very least, anytime something is serviced, we recommend collecting data. Um, with something like an EMS, you can collect data all the time and at varying levels of granularity with, you know, with our system all the way down to the minute level. And that can be super, super helpful in making sure that you're measuring the overall health of your assets. Yeah, I, I would echo, I would just chime in and echo Jack, Jack's sentiments. I mean, I, I think continuously in a perfect world, right? Um, if you're just getting started, I think, you know, the major events that happen, how you spend your money preventatively, even if you're doing that in a manual way, um, but capturing that is, is pivotal. Again, the, the, the cost to um, invest in an off the shelf CMMS um, platform these days is, is getting lower and lower. So to the degree uh, if you don't already have one, you know, the ability to collect all those things in real time and the controls around, hey, you know, look, if, if you're going to go get a repair uh, to rooftop unit, it has to go through the system, right? So there's, it, it forces the issue of tracking things like volume and spend and maybe even things down to the, the parts level and then aggregating all that, tying it to that specific asset and having the, the, the full history over time. Great, thank you both so much. And our second question is, are there specific KPIs or performance metrics that organizations should prioritize when using maintenance data for budget optimization? I think that, um, <clears throat> I think that there are a lot of answers to this one. And this is a good question. The first that kind of comes to my mind uh, that most operators are probably gonna be able to draw on would be looking at work orders. So if you have a site that consistently is putting in work orders for equipment, and that's something that you can track over time, then you can track where you have a recurring asset failure, right? So I think that that, as far as a performance metric or a KPI, could be a really, really helpful thing to look at. Um, if you have a more sophisticated solution where you have you know, granular trend data, like a BMS or an EMS, um, of course, you know we talked about zone versus set point delta. So if you have units that are consistently not able to meet their set points, that's a great KPI, right? So that can inform either making a set point change to give the unit some relief, or it can inform a decision to service the unit. So those would be my probably main two recommendations, but I'm sure Alex has thoughts as well. Yeah, I'd say, you know, what the other kind of, um, you know, take or, or context I'd take this to is what's happening with your OpEx budget, right? I think there's a lot of nuggets in that. If we're investing intelligently in our CapEx, you may not see it next month or next quarter, but over time, and you start to make comparisons and, and kind of normalize things as much as you can, if you're investing intelligently, you should see things like, you know, mean time fail to failure um, widen. You should see average ticket on your reactive OPEX spend go down, right? You should see the total cost to maintain the fleet go down um, over time. So, so I think looking at, you know, how is, what's the trend line look like for your OPEX and, you know, maintenance and repair expense line, right? Is that, is that going up? Is it, is it flatlined? And then as you start to make some of these decisions, hopefully based on data, they're the right decisions. 
you're going to see that offsetting trend or should certainly over time. Um, if you're not right, then there's some, some, some subsequent questions to ask about, are we making the right investments? Are we making enough investment? Um, what is our mix of preventative versus reactive spend look like, right? I mean, usually that's the recipe in some shape or form, in addition to um, the, you know, smart capital decisions as to what is your total cost of ownership. If, if you're only spending 10% of your budget on preventative work, the other 90% of the, that spend is going to be subject to things like after hour dispatches and overtime rates and premiums, opening up uh, part houses, right? And paying fees associated with that. So it's, it's death by a thousand paper cuts. If you can shift that over time in a utopian world to, hey, I'm going to spend, you know, 20 or 30 percent of my budget on reactive, you know, break fix and the other 70 or 80 percent on preventative um, doesn't happen overnight, but it, it can be a true game changer. Great. Thank you so much uh, for both those answers. So our last question today is what trends do you foresee in the future of maintenance data analytics and its role in capital planning and budgeting? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in here first because this is this is a topic that excites me. Um, as I mentioned, or I think you mentioned, Marsha, uh, with my bio. Yeah, I spent a lot of time in the multi-site um, outsourcing of, of facility maintenance, and um, you know, working with CMS, CMMS systems, both both homegrown and off the shelf. And I think um, you know those all do a really good job at collecting uh, volume and spend and all the things that we've kind of talked about. Um, they have the capability because they have an asset man management module where you could actually integrate and kind of look at that cross section of both energy management and um, facility maintenance, right? And look at like true integrated facility and energy management. I think that's the future for, for me and who does that really well, I think is gonna, gonna win in the space. How can people partner to actually deliver that type of solution? Um, because I can tell you that, you know, for, for 12 or 13 years, we talked about that possibility. I haven't seen it come to, to real fruition just yet in this space, but I think that's that's where we're heading, right? If we can, we can again, overlay where are we spending the most money on maintenance, preventative and reactively, and what are the biggest energy hawks? There's so much power in that cross-section of knowing I'm going to get really good return out of that capital investment. So I'm excited about that, that uh, trajectory and that, that overlap of um, functionality. Yeah, and I can, <clears throat> I agree. And I think that I can add to that as far as the, the future of uh, maintenance data analytics, um, from my perspective, and I, I'm going to kind of speak about our, um, our portion of the market, which is more, you know, small to mid-sized commercial, um, you know, in this market, we don't really see a whole lot of super advanced BMS systems and boilers and chillers and, you know, large systems with hundreds and hundreds of sensors. Um, we're a little bit more a small footprint. So for our particular share of the market, what we, you know, tend to, um, you know, what we tend to adopt and where we tend to install and, and excel is that small to mid-sized commercial. And what I think is going to be really, um, you know, really helpful in the future is going to be the predictive analytics side of it. So we don't have a million data points, but what we have can be really compelling. And what we can do with it is, create a baseline, create a model going forward and use analytics to predict failures before they happen. Um, a lot of what we're doing now is, is similar to this. It's not super sophisticated yet and it's not off the shelf yet, but I think for you know, a player in this space to be able to create something with a reasonable you know, accuracy reading um, that could say, okay, we can predict equipment failure within two weeks. That gives you enough you know, buffer to make sure that that issue is addressed before it becomes a failure. So I think that um, the predictive side of it is going to be huge. And I think that for us to add, you know, in our space, um, to see additional sensors, like, you know, one thing that we don't measure is refrigerant level. So, you know, if we can detect that, okay, this unit is out of refrigerant, then it's not going to cool or the same thing with your cooler or freezer. Um, if those are things that we can also measure, you know, including those, those pieces of data, can help aid in the predictive analytics process and therefore, you know, help inform these decisions. Well said. Great, well, again, thank you both so much. Uh, that does conclude uh, our webinar. If there are any questions that you have that were not answered, please feel free to reach out to us at smartbuildings at gridpoint.com. And I will have Alex and Jack in touch with you. <laughs> um, as a reminder, uh, the webinar recording will be available on 
the group point website within the next few days. Um, and then he will, will be sent out to um, everybody that's registered as well uh, once it is ready. Um, thank you again uh, so much. And uh, we hope to all see you at our next webinar. Thank you guys. Appreciate you spending some time with us. Have a great afternoon. Thanks everyone. Take care. All.